good afternoon good afternoon hope you're doing well this first weekend of 20 of december 2020 wow uh we've almost made it <laughs> to the end of the year what a year it has been what a year it has been good afternoon to you good afternoon um and welcome to God's Girls, Women on a Mission, Wives with Wisdom program. So I'm just going to give it a few minutes for you to log in. Let a friend know that we are live. We are live today, this first Saturday of December. Let your girlfriends know that we are live. Uh, let your fellow women know that we are live, your fellow colleagues, your fellow sisters, everybody that you know. Uh, needs to be um, encouraged this afternoon. Let them know we are live. And you know, as I always say, get your glass of water, get your cup of tea, get your hot chocolate, get whatever you need not to choke on what will be said today. You know, sometimes you always have those oopsie moments and you almost choke on yourself. We don't want that. So get whatever you need right now so you won't be interrupted uh, once we begin. Um, Trust me, today you wouldn't want to leave your screen. You want to take in everything that will be um, said this afternoon. So get your get your drink, get your drink, uh, and invite somebody. Invite somebody that's in leadership. Invite every woman um, that is serving the Lord, every young lady and woman that desires to be in the role of leadership, every wife, every pastor's wife, every... Uh, everyone that you know bears um, the label of being a woman in today's society, uh, you want them to be listening to this conversation today, and we don't want them to miss out. Wow. Let me know what your year has been like. Let me know what your year, you know, how did you make it through? this year i want to hear from you today I, I want to hear how how did you survive you know what were the things that you hung on to that saw you through such a year um because it has been one of those years that um has been mm, extraordinary and so i wanted to start this uh year's uh, this month's conversation with an extraordinary woman a woman that has stood the test of time that has stood many many chaoses in the world uh but do let me know how you uh how you have you know seen this year through seen how have you seen yourself uh, coming through this year how is how what are you looking forward to into the coming year are you planning for 2021 or have you joined the crew that are saying we are not buying diaries this year we planned for 2020 and all our plans went into the bin what are you up to what are you up to? It's so great to be with you this afternoon, this Saturday afternoon. Um, once again, if you're just joining us, welcome to God's Girls, Women on a Mission, a Wives with Wisdom program. Uh, wives, Wives with Wisdom program is not necessarily for married people, but it is... Um, the program that we uh, set aside time to speak to the married and unmarried uh, women that desire to do and fulfill the will of God, women that want to um, want to hear and learn from the older women. You know, the Bible says, let the older women teach the younger. This is the program that we use to glean on wisdom and uh, receive and uh, get some uh, strength, you know, pour some strength, draw some virtue from the older women within our society, within our nation. You know, uh, sometimes it's not necessarily older in age, but in older in wisdom, you know, older in um, the assignments that God has given them. Uh, but today is, is going to be... Uh, it's going to be a double blessing because we've got someone who is not just older in wisdom, but also older in age. So when she's talking about life crisis, she has been through quite a few, you know, uh, some of you have, this is your first national life crisis, but she's been through a few and we want to, uh, we will be hearing from her this afternoon. So I want you to invite as many people as possible um, so that they will not miss out on today's broadcast. Uh, today we're going to be talking about um, especially women in leadership today and tomorrow. Uh, I know uh, some of you are very happy that we've got the first black um, woman 
uh, as vice president. Well, hopefully she will be, you know, we're not going to go into what's going on in America, <laughs> but we hope that she will be. And uh, that will, uh, Kamala Harris, that will set uh, a record, a historical record. And uh, I'm hoping that she would be because, I mean, women, we have come a long way when it comes to leadership positions. And we are still going, you know, to places. I mean, we have seen uh, some changes, but I'm praying for even greater changes. And uh, someone, uh, um, the person that we have today, she is someone that has been to nations where she has spoken to leaders in her own leadership role, even as a woman. And we wanna hear uh, what it's like, especially today, to stand in such a position as a woman, you know, is it, um, is it what we think it is? Are we even influential when we are at such uh, top levels? Does it make any difference? As much as we will have, we might have the first female bright vice president black, will it make any difference to us? You know, uh, what does it mean for us if it does? So I'm excited about um, this today's conversation, women, uh, women in leadership today and tomorrow. So without wasting much time, today we've got the great, the legend, someone I respect and look forward and uh, look up to. We've got Reverend Celia Collins. She's the founder and president of Railboat Foundation, a cutting edge equipping organization offering equipment uh, offering leadership um, and vision development, consultancy, motivational and mentoring programs and executive coaching. And that is why we have her today. She knows what leadership is. She has stood in uh, the position for uh, such a long time. She has worked alongside some of the uh, great uh, people that we know, including even the late um, Dr. Miles Monroe. Uh, she is a, wo uh, a woman that knows what it is, not just to be a woman, but someone who has stood besides even men that are within leadership. So join me this afternoon to welcome Reverend Celia Collins. Good afternoon, ma'am. Uh, I've got you on mute, my apologies. <laughs> Good afternoon. You're trying to shut me down and it's too early in the program for you to shut me down. <laughs> uh, it will not even work even if I try. <laughs> Good afternoon and thank you for having me along to come alongside this wonderful, wonderful uh, program to serve uh, God's people. By the way, this is how leadership starts. It starts with service. And greatness starts with, with somebody recognizing that you have something to offer. So it starts with service. But we will, I'm going ahead of myself. I noticed <laughs> that you quite conveniently skipped my other name. Um, <laughs> yes, because I don't want to pronounce you it wrong. I... So my name is C Celia Apier J. Collins. It's very simple. It's Apier, and the G-Y-E-I is what throws people. It's J. Apier J. Collins. And like I said, it's very uh, such a privilege for you for me to be here. I had an organization called the Rehobot Foundation. Um, that's a, a cutting edge apostolic organization that specializes in leadership development. So developing leaders at every strata of society for every uh, mission in society. So whether they're political leaders, doctors, nurses, teachers, lecturers, philosophers, uh, politicians, we go there, bankers, um, uh, everything that the earth needs. Uh, mm -hmm. We are there to service and develop that leadership seed in people. And also, I had an organization called Young Emerging Leaders Forum. So I'm very much interested in millennials, um, uh, the emerging leaders, and how to shape their thinking before they occupy a post. A lot of time we postpone mm -hmm. uh, leadership to tomorrow. Everybody's waiting for a post, and I'm going to be explaining that in a second. But everybody's when you think of leadership, you think of a title, you think of a great position that you have to exploit something. Don't ever, ever postpone your leadership. Leadership is now. It's how you respond to things. It's what you do. And so I, I very much, it's my passion to raise emerging leaders, shape their thinking now, teach them how they can be leaders now. And, and, mm. and, and there's an agenda to it because for me, that means that if we, we intentionally raise leaders today, in the next 15 years, we're not waiting for chance. We're not waiting for an election to determine and contesting an election, all of those things. Uh, depending on what your persuasion is, but we can really tell what the future will be like because we have raised the kind of leaders. Mm. Yeah, mm. now I'm introducing leadership already. And in the mind of the ultimate leader, wow. God himself, watch his style. He knows he's going to create a nation called Israel. Mm. He knows that he's going to have a prototype nation that's going to uh, 
um, express who he is. He's going to work through them to model his desired kingdom for the whole world to see. So what does he do? He takes 80 years, 80 years in preparing mm. their leader. And so when he mm. says, I will give you the land and Israel will be this, he's reassured, he's confident because he knows what type of leadership he has already intentionally molded mm. and prepared to carry the future. That's wow. how we do leadership. Whether wow. you're in church, whether in our homes, you want to see what your children's families are going to be like in the future. I don't care. I have a grandson who is uh, seven years old, you know, tender, uh, seven months old. And, and I'm speaking leadership. I'm going to raise a Tino from now, even as a baby, wow. as a leader. So that wow. in 27 years time, I know that uh, Tino, I know what his family is going to be like. Mm. I know whatever business he starts, I know what the leadership is going to be like. I know what the business is going to be like because I know what I've invested inside of him. That's what God's doing with his girls. Wow. That's what God's doing with your life so that he can, he's assured of the future that he has um, prepared for us. So the first question we ask ourselves is to be or not to be. For me, that's the more all important question. God asks no man whether he will accept life. Mm. That is not the choice. You don't have a choice. You, you've already taken it. You must take it. The only choice is how you will accept life. Are you just going to be one ordinary person just wandering the streets feeling sorry for yourself? Or are you going to be this great leader? You see, men make history. History doesn't make men. <laughs> it's how uh, 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 they say that men make history and not the other way around. History doesn't make people. In periods where there's no leadership, society stands still. Progress occurs when courageous, skillful leaders seize the opportunity to change things for better. When you step into history, and I'm going to, uh, in, in a moment, I'm going to briefly uh, talk about the crisis that we're in. You were talking about that, Pastor Nomsa. Talk, and, and I'm even shocked that somebody would say, I'm not buying a diary because I don't return. Does the crisis make me or do I make the crisis? Come on. Crisis is not a shock to God. The first time you open the Bible, there's a crisis situation. What do you think the earth with that form of void means? But with a word, it was settled. Hey, <laughs> crisis will never bury me. Crisis will be my platform for exposure and for elevation. Mm. Go and ask Esther. She'll tell you. You were born <laughs> for this crisis. Change your mind before. Don't make me mad this day. Change your mind. You'll be wow. to 2017. I've already got bookings for 2021 already beyond. <laughs> I was going to say, this is why we've got you on the program today, because even from the introduction, I'm like, where's my notebook? Because, <laughs> ah, wow. Good afternoon, yeah. mom. My mom you, is watching you. us. Good uh, afternoon. Hello, mommy. Hope you're good. <laughs> my go <-go. laughs> She is. I was going to say, the name you oh, said, Tino, sounds like a Zimbabwean name. Exactly. <laughs> I know so, you are friends with my bishop, uh, um, Bishop Hove, Patience Hove. So I know, you, and you've been to Zimbabwe. <laughs> no, I haven't been to Zimbabwe. It's such Did a you not bishop. go? Enough? Yes, no, um, go. I'm sure Isn't you were on your flight at one of the later. conferences. That's a formidable oh, wow. woman. That's an incredible woman of God. She has my respect, my love any day. Uh, awesome. honestly, honestly, okay. <laughs> um, yeah. you, you are, uh, you've touched on certain things, but we will dive into them deeply when yeah. we're doing some questions. Yes. And answers. Okay. No problem at all. So we must settle the ambivalence of whether you want to be God's woman, God's woman of the moment, God's leader, or you don't want to be, nobody can decide it for you. You decide what you want to be. So first of all, we also want to settle the ambivalent question and the prevailing question, that which has kept women down, of whether women have a place of impact and influence in our world today. Do we have a place of impact? Well, according to Micah chapter 6, verse 4, God sent three leaders to redeem Israel out of a 420-year bondage. You see, when people have been in bondage for a long time, for 420 years, you must be careful who you send to redeem them. And God chose a woman... Oh, sorry, I beg your pardon. <laughs> God chose a woman as part of this powerful, powerful deliverance uh, set, this, this leadership team. So it was Moses, Ariam, Aaron, and Miriam. So from the beginning, in one of the most critical uh, leadership acts that was going to cause 
people, uh, the nation to emerge. And, and one of the first nation builders, you could have called her vice president if you like, if they had a democratic system there. She was the first deputy, she was the vice president uh, to Moses' president. Her name was Vice President Miriam. She was part of the team. She wasn't elected by man, she was appointed by God. Know that your leadership is not elected by man. It is not subject to man's opinion. Everybody has an opinion. You have an opinion about yourself. God has an opinion about you. And people who don't even know you have an opinion about you. So why do you let people who don't know you, who didn't create you, why do you let their, their opinions determine your actions? Listen, so God, I've seen from the beginning, God also made man. Design determines function. We will go there in a second. Why? Both genders represented results in balance. Do you know that women make up 49.4% of the world's population? There's enough of us to turn the world around. Enough. Enough of us. When men are oppressed, they call it a tragedy. When women are oppressed, it's called tradition. So today we defy tradition. We defy tradition. Let it be on record that we, the women gathered on God's girls today, oppose both oppression and oppressive traditions that make us and cause us to function in an inferior fashion, to function in a way less than Christ, our maker and our creator determined. We put it on record today. We will think different. We will not let anything hinder us or limit us, nor form false, false boundary, boundaries for us. Women constitute the highest percentage of church membership around the world. We have profound gifts and experiences that are crucial to the growth of the body of Christ and to the kingdom mandate at large to transform our world. So why are we silent? Why are we sitting back? Why are we apathetic? Why are we waiting for somebody else's approval? God has given women abilities, opportunities, and the mandates to bring change. You don't believe me. So in Genesis 4, men had abandoned God and they were getting more wicked. Actually, the first city, the first urbanization in the world it's, it's Genesis 4. We won't go there. I, I, I'm coming back and we will look into how you can manifest your leadership in the different spheres, in the different realms. When God first mentions a city, he doesn't mention it in terms of the populace. He mentions it in terms of infrastructure and the people's influence, leadership infrastructure, uh, influence on the infrastructure. That's very important for us to know. These are some of the reasons why we always feel like when you mention a calling and you think you could mention leadership, you always think that it's got to do with uh, what happens within the local assembly. But men had abandoned God and were getting more wicked. It was the woman Eve who asked God for another righteous son to replace Abel, the righteous one whom Cain had killed. When Enoch was born, it was said that men began to call on the name of the Lord again. The woman said, I, I, hate, I hate this situation. You see, leadership is a war against the status quo. Eve took leadership. She said, this situation is so bad. I got to do something. I got to petition heaven about it. Women, you know, what about women's performance in the marketplace, out in the secular world? Women improve corporate performance and returns on investment capital by 66%. Women do. We improve uh, the balance sheet of an organization of a business by 66%. Companies with the highest gender diversity teams, that means they have a mix of women and men, see a higher operating result by 40%, says McKinsey. 40%. Once you add women to the mix, the company goes up. Profits rise up. Performance is optimum. Having at least one woman on a board decreases the risk of bankruptcy. One woman sitting on a board. You know what? I've got to tell the places where I sit on several boards, national corporate boards in this nation, some of them for international organizations. i got to let them know. Having me on, and sometimes I'm just the only woman, decreases the risk of bankruptcy for them. Isn't that amazing? And you look at you, shame on you and shame on me. We'll go about looking down on ourselves. Anyone who has the potential and the capacity to change a mere sperm into a human baby and nurture that baby till it becomes an asset to the whole of humanity and society, surely should be embraced, celebrated, and allowed to do what she naturally does best: develop and change situations. After 15 years of genocide, Rwanda is making it. They have a robust economy. They have they model clean, orderly nation. People are using Rwanda. Yes, Rwanda as a model of what a great developing economy and a great healthy nation looks like. Could it be? Just could it be? Perhaps because it's first is the first country in history to break the halfway mark of having no less than fifty percent of fifty six percent. I beg your pardon 
of women making up its lower house of parliament. In other words, Rwanda has more women than men in the lower house of parliament. Maybe, just maybe, I'm just saying, I mean, I'm just saying, maybe that's why Rwanda is a model nation. This is not a competition between men and women. I'm just saying that women have something to offer. We have a catalyst anointing. We bring something to the table that changes the status quo, that elevates stuff, that speeding stuff, that lifts the stuff. We, we salvage things. It's the same with Rwanda Supreme Court. They have more women than men. And maybe that's why the nation is as it is. They, what about, you know what? Nothing is lost when you put it in the hands of, the woman, of a woman. Imagine there's a bowl of soup or stew or whatever it is you want to call it, and um, it spills to the ground. Everybody's like, oh, there's no dinner. Just leave the woman for a few minutes. She will salvage something. She will make something about it. You give her tomato, she can make salsa out of it. She can make soup. She can make stew. She can... She, she just one thing you give her she is so creative in her thinking she will turn it into something i always say this there is nowhere i have been around the world and by the grace of god i've probably been to 45 46 different nations and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cities around the world from cambodia to you know nepal all the way down to south africa all the way down to mexico you know been there done that and i have never been where i've seen women during the day on the streets just sitting there doing nothing I have seen men do drafts, you know? They are waiting for a job. Women are always busy doing something. We're just creative, we're just instinctive. Again, this is not a competition and a contest between men and women. Men have their place. I'm just talking about women. And maybe a man will say, you know, there's no food in the house, there's no money, and, and, and they don't know what they're gonna eat for the day. And, and maybe the man will say, okay, I'm going to go out and look for some money and bring home. And by, when he's leaving home, there will be no food. There's nothing on the table. There's nothing in the cupboards. By the time he gets home, the children would have eaten. I don't know how women do it. She, she's a magician. She will do whatever it takes. The children would have eaten. They will be in bed. She will even have left some for the man to eat with just a few insults garnishing it. You know what I'm saying? She'll do her attitude thing, but he will get something to eat. Why? It's just women. We create something out of nothing. It's just our wiring. Just that worry. So therefore, if you're listening to me today, I'm telling you, no one has a capacity to stop you. Not even death. Ask Elisha's bones. Death called him, but his bones were still alive because when somebody fell on it who was dead, he came alive again. You are the only one who can stop you today. And today we say no more, no more. The essence of who you are is in your thought life. Your thoughts reflect the lenses through which you look at life. Nobody can live successfully and consistently be, be beyond what they believe about themselves. So what do you believe about yourself? What do you believe about your leadership? Even when Adam sees his wife, Eve, he names her Eve. It means life spring. In the midst of chaos, the curse, despair, distraction, hopelessness. He doesn't know what the, the future is going to be look like. They've just been driven out from the presence of God. Adam saw hope for the world in this woman he called his wife. He recognized that she had capacity to bring transformation, wholeness, harvest, and, and, and the requisite success. She would salvage and make something productive out of their lives and something useful out of the ashes they found themselves in. He was so enthralled at, at her, at the dimension that she had, her creative dimension, her leadership dimension. Uh, he was so quick to associate with her. Nobody wants to associate with a failure. He said, ah, man, this is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. That's how Adam felt about Eve. I think he saw something awesome in her, that he wanted that association, he wanted that connection, he was excited to nurture her. He was not the only one who was excited about this latest creation. God, the creator, was excited too. And such was his belief in womanhood that he looked at her and said, she is good. When he finished it, he did a quality check and said, that's good. The word good means in the Hebrew, fit for purpose meaning that she was capable of achieving everything that she was birthed to achieve. You either believe this or you don't. The choice is yours. As a man thinketh, so he is. And so, you know, there's a lot I could talk about thinking, but I want to go dive straight into um, um, leadership. Psalm 49 verse 20 says this. Psalm 49 verse 20. It's a very, very important psalm if you're going to be doing leadership. He says, a man who is in honor or a woman, or man, generic man, human beings, who is in honor, 
and or called to leadership and does not understand it is like the beast that perish. Psalm 49 verse 20. What does that mean? When God has given you the opportunity to emerge as a leader, God has configured you, God has blessed you, God has a call of God upon your life to be a leader. And you do not understand it. The word understanding is the critical thing there. The word understanding means comprehend. It means to, to get it. I get it. Oh, I get it. That's what we're doing today. We want to get it. What does it mean to be a leader? What else does the leader act? How can I activate leadership? Mean? I get it. I comprehend it. I, I understand it. You know, I see it as it should be. It, it, it's shaping me. I allow it to affect me. The word understand also means uh, uh, kinsman. In other words, I related to it. I, this thing is... is is, is I see myself in it. I, 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 I make it my business to connect with what the truth is concerning this thing. To understand means to protect also. In other words, what I, I comprehend, what I, I relate to, I protect. I don't want it to escape from my mind. I, I don't want it to leak. I don't want to waste it. So it's part of preservation. He says, unless you, and then it's the becoming. I merge. I become that which I understand. Uh, it says, you, if you don't, the one who does not understand the honor, the one who does not celebrate the honor, the one who does not preserve the honor, the one who does not relate to the honor, the one who does not live what the revelation they have about the honor of, the, of leadership that is upon their lives will be like beasts that perish. The word perish doesn't mean you will die physically. The word perish means you will be dumb. In the Hebrew, it means dumb. In other words, your influence will be silenced. You will be cut off. You will not be influential in your life. That's a frightening thought. Why? Because you handled leadership carelessly. So we don't want to handle leadership carelessly. It's an honor. God calls it the call of God in you. When God made you, he says he made you after his own image and likeness. The greatest leader reflected himself in you. Therefore, you were born a leader, but you must live like a leader. You must become a leader. Becoming is a process. You change your mind. You begin to act like a leader. You become a leader. I always tell my people, they'll tell me one thing. What does Pastor Celia say? Leader is as leader things and does. You're only a leader according to what you say and do. So no one is more harmful than a leader with the wrong philosophy. Nobody is more harmful than a leader with the wrong belief system. Nobody is more dangerous than a leader with the wrong attitude or the wrong disposition. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, I like what Goeth says. He says, uh, um, he says, there's nothing more dangerous than an active ignorance. You're a leader, but you don't understand how leadership works. You have capacity to become a leader, but you don't know how to handle it. There's much, no more, more dangerous, nothing more dangerous than a, a leader with, with, who is ignorant because you don't know what leadership is about. So leadership, uh, it has been said, is about influence. Nothing more, nothing less. Nothing more, nothing less. Our world right now is lacking able leaders. I'm going to unpack leadership in a second. God's promise to our world is that he will restore leaders. Isaiah 126, ESV says, I will restore your leaders, your judges, those who vindicate. So leaders vindicate, they punish. Actually, Romans 13 says that every leader is there for your own good, to execute some things, to judge some things. Uh, uh, they are legislators, they contend, they defend, they provide uh, uh, us at the first and your counselors us at the beginning. And he says, then your environment, afterwards, your city will be called the city of righteousness. Your home will be called the home of righteousness. Your business will be called the business of righteousness, the faithful city. Why? Because nothing changes without leadership. Nothing is developed without leadership. Nothing advances without leadership. That's how critical you are. Nothing is sustained without leadership because everything rises and falls of leadership. See, leadership is therefore, it's not a, 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 an end. It's a, it's a goal. It's, it's not the goal in itself. It's a means to an end. Leadership is taking you somewhere. Leadership has the capacity when you employ it in your life uh, to take uh, you somewhere and to fulfill something. The world is looking for leaders. Let's look very quickly at Judges chapter 9. The story is told of Judges, in Judges chapter 9 that the trees, I think it was Abimelech who gave this um, proverb. He said the trees went forth out to look for a leader. And then they called out to so several elements of society. This has always challenged me. So I want to just share with you to see that how it will touch your life too. Um, one moment. Judges chapter 9, verse 7. 
Now, when they told Jotham, he went and stood on top of Mount Gerizim and lifted his voice and cried. And he said to them, listen to me, you men of Shechem, that God may listen to you. The trees once went forth to anoint a king over them. And they said to the olive tree, reign over us. But the olive tree said to them, should I cease giving my oil with which they honor God and man and go to sway over trees? Then the tree said to the fig tree, you come, you reign over us, fig tree. But the fig tree said to them, should I cease my sweetness? and my good fruit and go to sway over trees. The tree said to the vine, now you come, you come, definitely you can lead us. And the vine replied, should I seize my new wine, which hears both God and men and go to sway over trees. So the vine refused leadership, the olive refused leadership and, and the fig refused leadership. Why would they ask the fig, the olive and the wine? Fig in the desert, it represents substance. You know, the ability to fill their belly, sustain them health wise. The wine himself said it, the vine, he cheers God's heart. He's a bubbly. The vine represents your, 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 your passion, your zeal, your burden, your creativity. Uh, the oil represents your anointing. And these people said, come, you have the goods, come and lead us, be king over us. And all three, oil said, no, I'm too busy doing this. Priorities were wrong. Vine says, no. Fig says no. So what do the trees do? Let me tell you something. Human beings are so desperate for leadership, they'll take anybody. They go to the bramble. The bramble is a short shrub, but it's got lots of thorns. They go to the bramble and they say, you come reign over us. Reign, lead us, rule us, govern us, determine our going and our coming. Influence our lives. And the bramble said to the trees, hey, me, I'm not going to be like vine, oil, and fig. If you call me to come, and you anoint me as king over you, then you must come and take shelter under my bramble. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're listening to me today, bramble has no capacity to give shelter. It hasn't got uh, <laughs> branches. It's a shrub. So, you know, they went to the wrong person. He didn't have what it takes. He was pretending. He was deceiving. He said, he, well, you have to take it. And if you come and my tongue scratch you, so be it. That's all I have to offer you. But if not, and right now it's too late, if you refuse me, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the servants of Lebanon. Listen, he has nothing to give. And he's a danger to those who are inviting him. Why would people go to invite somebody who's a danger to them to come and rule them? Because when the right people refuse leadership, the world is so desperate it will settle for anything. I've just been teaching on elections in my own nation in Ghana. In fact, yesterday I, did a yesterday I did a recording for that as well. And one of the things I think it was Plato said, he says, if you refuse to vote, you will end up with your inferiors ruling over you. If you refuse to rise up to leadership, you will end up with idiots and fools and inferior people providing leadership that will harm your life. Leadership is the solution of God. It's the source of all our problems, but also the source of, source of all our solutions. Leaders determine everything. An army of sheep, you've heard it said before, with a leader will always defeat, defeat an army of lions that have no leader. And nobody definitely, like I'm saying, can lead beyond their attitude. Your attitude, your intake, your perspective of life is a product of your belief system. What are you conditioning yourself to think? You think Christ, oh my goodness, <laughs> do not wait on a leader. Look in the mirror right now. It's you. If you're seeing yourself in the screen, that's you I'm talking to. You are the leader. You are the leader. What needs to be done? Leaders ask themselves several questions. What needs to be done? What can I do? What fits my skill set? Where am I needed most? What do I have to offer? Listen, in the morning, those of us who come from Africa, we know when the cock wakes up and he crows, coo -coo -coo, he walks with confidence up down you know why because he reckons that he's his shouting of crowing that is ushering in the sun he is so confident when you believe that your leadership is making a difference you are so confident you will be so courageous you'll be so audacious you will break the limitation today believe say to yourself right now as you listen to me i am a leader hello i am a leader hello i am a leader and i'm born for such a time as this where can you Find lead, you, you exercise your leadership in health, education, government, politics, social, your family, your church, in business, in commerce, in justice, in our penal system, in media, in entertainment, in our city. Everywhere there's a need, there's a leader. Everywhere there's human beings, there's a leader. Leadership is about influence. Leadership is about changing the status quo. I like how my mentor put it. He said, leadership is the capacity to influence. 
through inspiration generated by passion motivated by a vision you must have a vision so first of all you're passionate about something you want to find your area of leadership what are you passionate about when you're passionate about something uh then you have a vision lady nomsa is passionate about empowering women taking wisdom of God and empowering women. So she created a, a vision called God's girls, <laughs> God's women on a mission. So her passion created a vision. And how did that vision come about? How did that passion come about? That vision came about out of a conviction. She knows and knows and knows and knows that this is what she's called to do. I know, listen, part of what my passion is about is I want to raise about three presidents before I die. You know, and I know, and I know, I know, I know. And once you know, it determines what you invest in. So if you look at my books that I read, I don't just don't read everything. I have to understand GDPs. I have to understand how governments work. I have to understand the rule of law. I've been studying the rule of law this week. What does that got to do with pastoring? Because I know that my job is not just as a preacher. My job is to raise leaders. If I'm to raise leaders, I, ha I have to understand the sphere that I'm going in. So you see what I'm saying. There's a conviction inside of me uh, that I, if I don't do this, I'll die. <laughs> I, something, I, something will eat me up. I'm not happy until I'm doing it. And that is produced by purpose. Purpose means my reason for existence. This is why I live. Some of you, when you find your purpose, you will refuse to die. You will refuse to die. When you find your purpose, you will refuse to die. Why? Because you know what? You, you haven't lived out your purpose yet. When you find it, you'll fight back. They tried to kill Jesus three times. He disappeared. As a baby, they tried to kill him. He, they, they didn't succeed. Even the king's, the Magi's mind were changed so they couldn't report it back to Herod. He hid in Egypt. They tried to push him off the cliff in Luke 4 when he announced his anointing. It wasn't until his time came in, he had finished everything. When they came to get somebody, he didn't run to hide. He didn't disappear. He said, is it me you're looking for? Take me now. That's how you live. When you find purpose, leaders begin with their purpose. And purpose births vision. And vision comes out of passion. And passion is created by a conviction of what God has called them to do. And that conviction is because of a burden that they're feeling. What are you feeling? What makes you angry? What makes you upset? What do you so want to change? change in this life that you it makes you angry it makes you want to cry it makes you want to do something this is how leadership is birth leadership comes when you start solving problems about the things that affect you bother you the most annoy you the most the things that you want to do something about the most so, see leadership is influence what is influence influence is the capacity to change the way people think the way they feel their attitudes their behavior leader influence is the capacity to change outcomes so listen my time is drawing there and this is just part one maybe we will tease out some of these things when we come to speak in, in a in the q a session but so then how is how is what makes for leadership a leader needs influence but before he can have influence he has to have a sense of responsibility so you want to be a great leader have a responsibility what are you responsibility means if it's going to happen it's up to me it's up to me and god god that is bit now is waiting on me so if I take responsibility for something. I'm saying that I'm going to make sure it happens. Rank does not confer. When you're a leader, it does not confer a, a privilege upon you, nor give you power. It imposes responsibility upon you. But when you have responsibility, responsibility works with two things. Responsibility gives you authority. It gives you accountability. And it gives you the third thing it gives you is power. When you have responsibility, that's part of the authority. So a person who is influential needs power in order to be influential. I always say that the easiest way in which I could uh, define power is permission. Somebody gives you permission to lead them. That's power. They give you power. Power is given and power is taken. So there are five sources of power. Remember, every leader is birthed out of influence. Leadership comes out of influence. When you're being influential, so leadership is actually is an end product. <laughs> Nobody just says, I'm a leader, I'm a leader, I'm a leader. No, leadership is is is, uh, is the end product. We recognize uh, uh, leadership when we recognize what has been achieved and what has been impacted and what has been influenced. So especially for those of you who are pastor's wives, you're going to need this thing that I'm saying, especially for those of you who are managers, who, who see yourself as somebody. Please listen to the next five minutes of what I'm going to unpack in power. And so you need power to be influential. There are five sources of power. The first source of power is God. It's only God who gives you power to do what you have to do. So 
that source comes from God. God says, Jesus said, when Pilate said, you know, I could do this. And he said, no, 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 hang on, hang on, chill out. And let, let me correct you. You have no power that wasn't given to you. I gave you the power to try me. So every power that we have, everybody who sits on the throne somewhere, whether they're good or bad, God gave them permission. He gave them uh, capacity and occasion to be where they are. So your first source of power comes from God. Your second source of power is one that we're very, very familiar with. And our second source of power is what we call positional power. So I'm the chief pastor here. I'm the CEO of Real World Foundation. I am the uh, uh, apostolic leader of so young emerging leaders. I am this, I am that, I am the manager, I am the supervisor. And when we have that, we think that that gives us power. But let me tell you something, that is the least power you will ever walk in. Yes, it gives you a certain degree of power. When you have a title, when you have a position, they just <clears throat> called you and appointed you as the commander in chief of that. But listen, have you ever heard of the phrase that says you can be in office, but not in power? So when you have a title, it gives you an office, a position, but you won't be in power necessarily. God removed Saul from power. But for 30 years, when Saul died, the people came to David and they said to him, even while Saul was alive, you were a real leader. Saul had his face on the money. He was the one directing parliament, government, he, everybody. He was receiving diplomatic relations from the queen, everybody. But he didn't have the power. He wasn't the one influencing the people. The people said, we didn't listen to him. We listened to you. The one they listened to is the real leader. That's a whole different story. So you can be in office and have a post, but not in power. You are not influencing people. You are not impacting people's lives. That's what it is. So if, and so that's why I said your position power is the least power you ever walk in. Has some, your supervisor ever come to you and they said, no, sir, I need you to do this. And then, yes, yes, sir. <laughs> yes, I will do it. Yes, sir. And then they go and then, let me see. You know what? You brush them off very lightly. Why? They don't influence you. They don't impact you. They don't inspire you. You don't feel like doing what they say. So you vote with your feet. Do people obey you? Do they do what you say? If they are voting with their feet, they're telling you you're in position, but you're not in power. Listen to me. Listen to me. So what is your third source of power? If this is my least one, there must be one that's greater. Your greatest ever source of power is going to be what we call personal power. Who you are. What kind of person you are. In Psalm 78, verse 70, Psalm 72, uh, I beg your pardon, Psalm 72, verse 70. I need a cup of tea. Let's look at the psalm. I'm getting my psalm wrong. It's either 72, 78. <laughs> psalm 78, verse 70 to 72. God says this. And by the way, leaders don't know everything. Sometimes they get things wrong. And I was muddling up my scripture there. Psalm 78, verse 70 to 72. God says this. He says he also chose David in seven. Listen, even when God was choosing his servant David, he, to, he, he gave him a job description. To, 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 he took him from the sheephold, from following the ewes that had young, and brought him to shepherd Jacob, his people. That was a leadership position. But watch it. He said, so he shepherded them according to the integrity of his heart and the skillfulness of his hand. God looked at two criteria of which he chose David to be an influencer. His character, the integrity of his heart. And the next thing was his competence. competence. We'll deal with competence in a second. So number one, your character. Are you kind? Are you trustworthy? Are you an integrous person? Do, do, do you relate? How do you relate to people? Are you far removed from them? Do you want people to... To, to serve you, or are you a servant? Leadership begins when you begin to solve problems for people, when you serve people, when you're doing all of this, all the stuff that you're doing, cleaning bombs, that's a servanthood. And he says, those who want to be servants, they will be great because they will be celebrated. The people you honor most are the people who have invested something in your life, done something for you. That's what servants do. Does. And so servants don't look for titles. They look for towels. Servants, please write that down. I will look for a towel. Have a towel. Every time you have a towel, that means you're looking for some dirty feet to wash. You're looking for something to do, something to serve, somebody to serve. And your character, kindness, humility, servanthood, a sense of responsibility. These are character traits. That's the most powerful power you have. People see that. Once they see that, they create buy-in. Every leader, even if you're appointed by God, you need buy-in. Go and ask Joshua. When God, Jesus died, Moses died, 
um, uh, God told him, he said, the people haven't given you buying yet, but I will do some things for the people to give you buying. So the fourth power, I'm going to finish off when I finish my fifth power. The fourth power is this, um, is competence power. So we look at God, we looked at uh, your position, and then we looked at your personal power. That's who you are, what you, your, your makeup, your characteristics. I don't mean your physical makeup, I mean the makeup, your configuration, your, your personality. Oh, I don't like people. I don't like being with people. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, we're reading that. And if you don't like being with people, then you'll be by yourself because you ain't, you ain't getting buy-in. See, that's why they say this. If you're a leader and you're walking alone, you look back and nobody's following you. You're not influencing anybody to do what you're doing. You're only taking a walk. You're not leading. Because the whole essence of leadership is to create followership and buy-in. And character creates buy-in. So ladies, listen to me. Um, Pick your quarrels at church very, very, and at work very carefully. Give your best. Become, 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 become. Because becoming creates influence. It doesn't matter. You're always under trial. People want you to prove something first. And the first thing they want to prove is what kind of person are you? Once you do that, you're good. You create that. And so... After that, then we have competence. So, you know, David goes on the battlefield and everybody begins to ask him, when he, he says, so, so this Goliath person, what did King Saul said he would give as a reward if I defeat Goliath? Everybody says, shut up. Who do you think you are? Ta, 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 ta. Everybody tries to shut David down. They say, what are your credentials? You, you Just how you know. You just came to give lunch to your brothers. Leave it and just go. Leave the sandwiches, just go. And let us who trained in this military camp and who are generals and who have several years of experience. Let us handle this. Everybody wants to know who, which, who certified you. Where's your PhD? You know what? When David defeats Goliath and cuts off his head, nobody, not one person, asks him the same question. Nobody says, show us your credentials. Nobody said who appointed you as leader. The people themselves crowned him as leader. They said Saul has slain his thousands. David has slain his ten thousands. What do we mean? When you... Leadership is created when you, and the power of competence, when you are skillful, when you are able to solve problems. I told you, leadership starts when you start solving problems. The moment he solves Israel's, Israel's problems, everybody forgot that he's a smelly shepherd boy, that he doesn't have the right uniform, that all he's been looking after is sheep and goats. No, everybody forgot that they began to celebrate him. You want people to celebrate you, know your goods, know your area, know your content, be good at what you do. Let the spirit of excellence be upon you. Every time you do something, you are leaving your signature down there. Let them say, ah, this is serious. This is nonsense work. I can see the excellence. I know she's a no compromise lady. I know this is she, she. The only reason you're listening to me today is not because I'm pretty. It's not because I'm even old. It's because you think I know what I'm talking about. My expertise, my competencies have created influence from around the world for me. I didn't have to call nobody. Simply because people think I know what I'm talking about, and I do know what I'm talking about, by the way, it creates influence. It creates power for me. So remember, you need power in order to influence. And power comes out of buy-in. So you, your character, your, your, your competencies, be good at what you do, for goodness sake, be good. Don't get by. People who don't get, who get by never become great leaders. Be good at what you do. Be known as one who is good. If you're a nurse, be the best. Read the journals. Learn. If you're a caregiver, I don't care what level you are. You're a caregiver. Learn about caregiving. Let Know your stuff, man. Know it. Know it. Invest in learning. You don't have to, may not have to go to school because we may not all have the time to go to school to learn something, but we can all improve on our competencies by, by keeping up to date with things that are in our field. So be good at what you do. I don't care if you're a cleaner. Know what are the best products. This one, if I use it, this one shines that way. See, it's not really about your vocation. It's about how you do it. Clean the floor so that, it, I think he said, um, like Michelangelo, clean, Michelangelo said, he said, uh, no, it's Martin Luther who said it. He said, clean the floor like Michelangelo painted. Do it so it's a work of art. Do it so skillfully. Know it. If I apply water this way, this is what happens. I apply this. It's not really about the job that you do. It's how you do it. It's how you do it. That creates that power. And then lastly, but not the least, the fifth source of power for you after your competence 
is also this. And I tell a story. One day we took our kids to the beach and they were all playing, you know, young kids, they were all playing football. And, and suddenly we noticed that they had stopped playing ball and they were following this 12 year old ball called Johnny and Johnny had the ball. So we said, aren't you playing football anymore? And the kids said, no, Johnny doesn't want to play. And we looked at Johnny and Johnny said, it's my ball and I don't want to play, I don't want to play. But Johnny, didn't, Johnny was just going and all the kids were following Johnny. We called our kids and we said, come, come for ice cream. Do you want fish and chips? No kid came to their mother. Trust you me, no kid. At that moment, at that particular moment, Johnny, the 12 year old boy had more influence over our own kids. We paid for our kids to come on the coach. The kids are not listening to their moms. They are not listening to their dads. They are following Johnny, a 12 year old boy. At that moment, Johnny is the most influential leader. He's more influential than parents. Why? What makes Johnny so powerful? Johnny has something everybody needs, the ball. At that moment, so leadership is very contextual. What do you have that people need? The moment you have something that people need, they crown you as leader. David had his expertise. <laughs> he brought it from the sheepfold, having expect, killed lion and bear, and he, he, had a, so, uh, he managed to kill Goliath. That's what crowned him as a leader. He brought something to the table. What's your ball? What are you bringing to the table that people need and want? Leadership starts with an audit of your skill set. What do I have? What am I good at? I can't be good at everything. And I don't want to be somebody else. I've got something inside of me. I'm fully loaded and I came with something to offer. Once a leader finds that ball, it sets the ball rolling in another direction. Because leadership is not about a title. It's not about a status. It's an opportunity to utilize what you have to change something and give somebody something that you have that they need. They crown you as a leader. Women have lots of opportunities because we are natural problem solvers. We were born. Your leader, have you noticed if a woman is passing in the living room, she will touch a, key, a, a cushion and arrange it another way. That's just us. We always want to take things to another level. You meet a man. How do you know a man found a good woman? Or how do I know? Sometimes when I was pastoring, I could tell the young men, I called them and say, hey, you, come here, Frederick. You found a girl. A pastor, how do you know? I know, because you started to dress better. You look better, you smell better, you, you just look together. Somebody's been helping you. You notice, that's why Lady Nomsa, when you married your man, look how fine he's looking. So sometimes a man dresses, you say, ah, wasn't his wife at home? Because the socks are yellow, the ties got three days egg on it. And you know what? Women have a way of putting things together, beautifying everything. That's called leadership. There's a criteria, there's a choice, there's a standard. But ultimately, you decide. You came already inbuilt with the capacity and i really want to end it here you know how do i know you came inbuilt with the capacity to lead how do i know that you know how to lead how do i know that you can lead because at the beginning you were made like god the ultimate leader it's the modus operandi of god that whatever he wants delivered he'll create capacity in that thing so and the easiest example I could do use is when we first see Lucifer, you see Lucifer was made to create worship according to Ezekiel and Isaiah. He was created to create worship. So the Bible says in him was inbuilt timbrel and harp. In other words, God, Lucifer's whole makeup was a configuration of, of musical instruments. So whenever Lucifer moved like this, he would make music. Whenever he moved, whenever he did this, whenever he did that, music would come out of him. Why? Because he was an inbuilt full of musical instruments. God built capacity inside of you because of the solutions he wants, because of the outcome he wants, because of the influences he wants that's coming out of you, because of the things he wants you to impact. So you already came with the capacity to build. The first thing, one of the first things leaders do is that it's, they self-discover. That's why leadership starts at the altar. You get with God. And Corinthians says, in him you see you. You'll find out what he's put inside of you. I'm going to end here and allow Lady Nonsa to take over. Thank you very much. 
Wow, wow. What a good lunch this afternoon. What a good lunch. Hope you're being blessed, ladies and gentlemen that have joined us this afternoon. Good afternoon, those that have just joined. Thank you so much for being with us um, on today's broadcast. Uh, wow. Thank you so much, Rev Celia. That was that was neat indeed. Uh, we could I could feel that you were born for such a time as this, and especially for the young and emerging leaders. Um, one of the things that uh, we like to do, uh, especially on this platform, wives with wisdom, is to deal with the everyday realities of life and be uh, authentic and honest and open with all uh, our viewers. Um, so when we look at uh, someone like you, we see um, an extra extraordinary woman in a place of influence and um, a courageous woman. Uh, but, and then we look at ourselves, we are thinking, ah, I, I, can't, I can't be like Reverend Celia, like she was born like that. She, she, <laughs> she was made like this. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. How did you get to a place whereby um, when you are invited to a nation you're not just impressed by preaching in front of a thousand people but you also want to sit down with the leader of that nation uh, whether it's that community or that village or the nation itself how did you get from how did you get from being born to this place or were you born in this place that you are today no nobody's born um the story is told of a of a, of a man who went through a city that had a town that had so many great, great leaders. So he, he actually called an old lady and said, so how many leaders were born in this place? How, how, many, um, um, how many have you produced? She said, no, no, they're not born, they're developed. Nobody's born a leader, they grow into leadership. You're born with the capacity to lead because you're made, every human being on this earth mm -hmm. is made, is born with a capacity to lead. It's that you must find your inspiration. See, remember what I said, leadership is not a title. Hmm. Leadership is an outcome. It's a means to an end. God grants leaders so that leaders can do something. So it's an opportunity he gives you. So first of all, you have to, disc you have to I think leadership starts with a burden, hmm. something that breaks your heart. So I've always loved people. I've always loved people development. And everybody starts somewhere. When you find something that you like, I've always served anyway. From the time that I was saved, I've always served. I didn't wait for a title. I, in fact, for many, many years of my life, until I even started Rehoboth, I used to be called, in my language, they say, your flesh loves work. When we first started our church, my first pastor, I would be the one cleaning the toilet. I drove the church van, the bus. I picked up people. Wow. I lived an hour and a bit away from church. I dropped everybody off. I picked everybody off. I'd be the last to leave because I had the keys. I did, but that's how I was developing my leadership. Leadership is work, it's service. And wow. as, the more I developed, the more God could trust me with more. But as I became exposed to things, I began to realize what was my strength and what was not my strength. Mm. I began to realize mm. what I had grace for and what I didn't have grace for. Mm. I began to develop... To, to, to also to do is to exercise so i'm developing my muscles you see i i tell people all the time that increase doesn't come from hoarding increase obeys the law of use wow. you can't sit down do nothing and still expect to be great it's the use mm. as i began to use so i develop for example people don't want to start somewhere but i develop my public speaking skills from doing announcements at church literally <laughs> so from the church being in the living room to the time the church became hundreds and thousands of people i developed it and my pastor used to shout at me because i'd always get something wrong and he'd be like blah, 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 blah. and i didn't leave church <laughs> thank god i didn't leave that church because if i did i wouldn't be where i am See, I love politicians. Wow. My, see, let me, I'm speaking to someone. Somebody feels like, oh, dude, I don't like the way they're treating me at church. Shut up. Your destiny is bigger than the way anybody is treating you. Just humble yourself and learn. God has put you there so that you can develop something. Do you know, God told me, he said, I chose those I wanted you to serve under. Right now, I have a lot of political influence. I work with, you know, I, I, I love, like I say, politics. No, I don't want to run for elections. I'm called to serve people in national office. But guess what? My pastor used to be the uh, 
the, the secretary general for the whole of the Law and Bar Association of a Nation. And then he used to be a minister in government. It was when he came into exile that he started the church here. So you see, God knew I was going to be exposed to leaders of that, national leaders, and he brought me under somebody with a national leadership anointing. And I did not know. The man used to just shout at me, do, he used to treat me like I was his daughter. And people used to say, aren't you going to leave this church? Look at how they're treating you. Thank God I didn't listen to any of them. Do you understand what I'm saying? So you start from somewhere. So that's my start. <laughs> And yeah, you know, thank God. And say so he used to always used to let me do stuff. They say the hair on the back of a good donkey is always one thing because he's the one always working. But you know, mm. my serving in church now gives me authority. Now they pay me and fly me across. When I go, I go to the nations, I don't pay myself. They fly me to come and serve, to come and teach people how to serve in their church. Simply because mm. somebody gave me the opportunity to serve in the toilet. Wow. What you do today is a seed for your own future. So that's how I've been exposed. You can't learn leadership. Leadership is not theory only. It's practical. So every time you have to do something, that's you're developing your leadership. Too. And that's how I developed. And then I find a passion for people, for teaching people, for developing people. And it grows. The more you do, the more God opens up for you, opens up. I've had to make great sacrifices in my life. At some point in my life, I think it was 1992 or 93, I had to leave everything and go with my daughter to the States to learn. I left being a successful pastor, being a successful principal of a Bible college, and we went to sleep on the floor because God told me this. He said, I want to take you places. He said, I want to do some things with your life, but you haven't got what it takes. You think you do, but you don't have it. But if you can humble yourself and let them train you in the college where you're going, it seems like you have nothing. If you shut up and stop complaining and humble yourself, when you're done with, I'll say, that's my woman. Just like when Esther humbled herself and it wasn't her who chose even her clothes that she was going to go to the king with. She allowed the, them to shape her, oil her, and the, the eunuch chose for her. When the king saw it, there was no competition because the only one who looked like his woman was Esther. Was it just favor? She submitted herself to that process. So mm -hmm. God, I had to make some sacrifice to learn. Sometimes even my supervisor at, 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 at Bible college, you know, in America, I went to Ohio. I would look at them and, cause I used to volunteer and I'm like, I can teach this guy with my eyes closed. I remember one day Ben Hinn was coming to our college and to our church. And I, I used to volunteer at the department, the ministry relations department in church. And they asked me, we're having a little fasting. And they said, pray. When I prayed and I shared, afterwards, the, the, the leader called me and said, you are a liar. You are not a first year student. Tell me what you, I said, no, I'm a first year because I tore up all my business. I didn't want any, I was so embarrassed that people say, what is this wow. person doing? <laughs> you know, at first level, when I've been teaching the same things that I'm being taught, but God said, I didn't just take you there. Now I'll just end with this. I, I just want you to catch something on the pathway of a leader's development. God will frustrate you. This is for somebody who's listening. It just came in my heart. This is for somebody. You remember the Bible says that he makes us to lie down in green pasture. Mm, mm. That lying down. Maybe you thought I was just going to give you one, two, three strategies. I don't know because we're all at different places. But it's the processing of God that we, run, we don't understand. That lying down means when they've set out to go from where they are to where they're going to pasture and eat, they get to a middle day and the, sh the shepherd makes it impossible for them to travel further. And so he stops the entourage. And he doesn't force them, but he makes it impossible for them to advance. So they have to lie down. But where they're lying down is green pasture and still waters. And he does it for two reasons. Only he knows how far the rest of the journey is. And only he knows their capacity. They won't make it. They'll die on the way. Mm. So mm. he frustrates them. Somebody, you're listening to me. You're saying, ah, but my husband won't let me do this. The people don't let me do this. Eh? It's like, uh, I don't get to preach. I don't. It's okay. Chill. God's developing something. But notice, it's n don't focus on the frustration. Don't focus on the fact that you made to stop. Look around you. It's still green pasture. Eat. Come on. Re-energize. Load up. Sharpen yourself. Build up yourself. Come on. It's still water. By the time you're ready to go, you can make it. And God says, the reason God sent me to America, he said, Celia, you don't have what it takes. I am going to build what it takes inside of you. And he stripped me and made me lie on the floor. And I had no money. <laughs> I used to go and line up for food bank. Just so I would be blessed. But 
It was more, he was shaping my character. And then the, he's also told mm. me, he says, you're walking in hope and you call it faith. I'm going to teach you how to walk in faith. For the last 21 years, I've been living by faith. But faith wasn't developed in an instant. It was developed mm. in the back here, somewhere in Ohio, where God stripped me down and taught me to trust him every single day. I work with politicians. I work with CEOs of banks. I never ask anybody for a penny because you can't bribe me with money. I've learned how to abase yes. by the grace of God, the mercies of God. I've learned how to abound. May God keep me like that. Do you understand what I'm saying? So God develops us. And so I've had opportunity and I've served. And of course, I had a good mentor. That's another thing. I had a good mentor as well in Dr. Miles Monroe. So find yourself a good mentor. It has been proven that those who go far in life have always, by all means, all throughout their life, been mentored by at least five people. The Bible, at the examination of about a thousand leaders in scripture, they realized that only 33% made it running. All the rest were limping or disqualified because they didn't have good mentors and they didn't listen to good mentors. I could go on and on, but, you know, I'll end uh, this part of the question here. Wow. Powerful. That is amazing. Um, because oftentimes we tell people, you know, you are like uh, Deborah, but we don't let them know that Deborah was just a homemaker uh, who arose when uh, the occasion uh, arised. And uh, we also talk about, you know, uh, we, uh, we talk about Esther. We don't, you know, we don't tell people that Esther was a nobody, but there was a process that she went through. You know, we talk about people like uh, Rahab. Rahab, she was just a homemaker. Uh, but that frustration of just thinking, I'm just a homemaker. Just you know, even um, remove the word just. Can I correct that? Just, just take off the, I don't even like the word homemaker. I, so I like the word homemaker instead of uh, um, housewife. So I call them domestic mm. consultants. And my favorite domestic homemaker, my favorite domestic consultant in scripture is domestic consultants. Yes. Ah, uh, that's a, my new name, people. <laughs> yes, you are. She's a woman called Jochebed. Let me tell you why. Because some woman is listening to me, thinking the whole world is passing me by. I'm just looking after my children. This woman is so prophetic, and she's so good at homemaking that God gives her a grace to raise three leaders that is going to change the whole world. Miriam, Aaron, and Moses. If she was out doing business like every other woman, she wouldn't have been able to. Come on. So don't tell me about homemaking. Some of you, God has at home because nobody can take care of your children like you can. Right now, there's a prophetic grace upon your life to guide them, mm. to steer them in the right direction, to protect them from what... We all have different lives. And the trajectory and the pathway that God takes us depends on our parenting. Don't mm. ever... Take parenting for granted. God visits a woman called Mary and says, this child will break your heart. So when, um, and, 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 and so when he's preaching and other people say, can't you tell your son, you know, they're going to kill him if he doesn't stop attacking these fighters. Like, I leave him alone. God already told me he's going to. I have grace to take this because he's going to break my heart. To watch my son hanging. She never tells her son not to preach. The, imagine if your son is John. He's a nerd. Well, other kids are all playing uh, uh, football, the guy is there reading his Bible, doesn't want to mix with them. The guy is weird. Other people are saying, I want to be lawyers. They're driving Mercedes. They're having business. They're bringing women to show you. No, your son is decided to live out there in the wilderness somewhere. No, no, no. Listen to me. Uh, you as a parent, you were configured. You were designed mm. to bring up this mm. peculiar child. Never want to be like anybody else. Take your parenting seriously. You are the one who determines what your child should be. Mm. Because Amen. there is no such thing as a vacuum in life. Any space you leave the enemy, he will step in. There is no such thing mm. as a vacuum. Nature mm. hates vacuums. So every vacuum, every space you leave alone, something will occupy. And it will always wow. be of darkness. Wow. Take your, whatever God has given to you, be convinced that God has given this to you. And once you're convinced that this is what God has called me, never let anybody bring you down. My God, you put up your head and say, you are the president. I'm also the home consultant for my children. Watch this space. Amen. Watch Amen. This space. Amen. I got them. You're not God. just a mother. If you're listening, you're not just a let mother. Them take out the word just from there. Hmm. There is no such thing as a just anything. Just say, so, oh, can I tell you another story? Can I do that? A, we're here. We're here. 
my very favorite creatures, one of my very favorite creatures, Lady Nomsa, you, you come from Zim. Mm -hmm. Are there any mosquitoes in Zimbabwe? Ah, <laughs> we live with them. <laughs> no, you live with them, okay. So can you, can you describe to me a, an elephant, please? Huge, ah, um, scary. Um, uh -huh. Yes. <laughs> uh, frightening, big yeah. Yes, big ears. Oh, no, describe. Big describe oh, big ears, big ears, big trunk, huge legs, just big uh, body, ugly. just humongous. <laughs> okay, so now you laughed when I asked you if you knew a mosquito. It's like, are you crazy? We live with them. That's what you said. Describe a mosquito to me, please. Uh, tiny, um, can hardly see it. <laughs> um, small legs, small head. Um, Describe the head. You've never insignificant. Seen a head, <laughs> no. Keep on. Anything that comes to mind when uh, you think of a mosquito, tell me. Anything that comes to mind when you think of a mosquito. A uh, small, can't even see it if it's on the ground. Um, mm. What comes to your mind when you think of a mosquito? The moment I mention mosquito, what came to your mind? Um, bite, scary, biting, um, yeah. <laughs> okay. So most people, if I ask a mosquito, they'll tell me scary, biting, dangerous, annoying. Mm. It's quite mm. expensive when you're traveling to the tropics, right? You have to take medication oh, yes. because of that tiny yes. thing. You see, you couldn't, you were struggling to describe the mosquito, but you've lived with the mosquito all of your life till you move to the place where there's no mosquitoes. That one, that mosquito kisses you every single night, but you couldn't describe it. But yet when you describe hmm. a mosquito, you describe the elephant in terms of its physique, ugly, dark, big, mm. ears, task, big legs. But invariably people describe the mosquitoes in terms of their impact. Mm. Just because mm. it is small, has more impact than, a mos than an elephant. Nobody has been able to describe a mosquito thoroughly to me. They always end up saying, it's annoying, it will bite you. It is nobody says an elephant even, nobody has even told me an elephant attacks. Everybody it's talks true. about it's true. the impact of the mosquito, yet you couldn't describe the mosquito. You see, it's not about the position. It's not about even the visibility. It's about the impact. Leaders think wow. about impact. Wow. A rose doesn't have to be seen to be smelt. Wow. It's always about impact. So you must ask yourself, what impact do I want? Then you position yourself in the best place. You see, if the mosquito was coming in your face or your face all the time, no. But the mosquito is so subtle. It comes under the cloak of darkness. And yet it is so tiny that nobody is impervious to it. If you may be sleeping and tell your husband will say, nobody should come to the room. You say, daddy is sleeping, nobody disturbed. The only person that's able to wake up that mosquito, that, that daddy is a mosquito. Because the moment the mosquito <laughs> enters the room and it goes, Z -Z 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 -Z. daddy is going to look for a weapon right now. He's going to get up and start hunting <laughs> for it, right? See, if the mosquito has no respect, you can be a king, you can be a queen, you can be a pauper. It has no respect for anybody. Right. It's tiny. People don't even know how to, to, to describe it. The mosquito is not offended. It just says, wait till I kiss yeah. you. Then you know that I'm unforgettable. Stop waiting wow. for people to celebrate you. You are significant. The, op the opposite of significant is trivial, unimportant. Leaders know that they are significant. For me, my biggest gift is that I understand that I'm significant. Hmm. I tell myself, you are significant. So whether I'm ministering to one person or I'm ministering to 10,000 people. The other day, I spoke for a, a world, a global charity. Their staff, there are 37,000 people. You know what? Whether I'm ministering to 37,000 people or I'm ministering to, I don't even know how many people are on this line. I didn't ask you how many people were on the line before I came. So whether it's one person, even if it's you, you're worth it. And you're, you don't even use L'Oreal. Hmm. <laughs> you're worth it. Why? <laughs> because I'm significant. I believe that I have something to offer. Leaders start by believing God has designed them for such a time as this. They have something to offer. Hmm. They have hmm. something to give. They make a difference. If you don't have that mindset, you'll never achieve anything in your life. Wow. 
Wow. Amen. Amen. Ladies, ladies, I hope you are taking a note or two. Um, one of the things that um, we know about you is you have been uh, nominated. Uh, you, you didn't even need the nomination, but you are one of the most influential women, uh, not just in this nation, but around the nations. Uh, what has been key in uh, staying um, in humility. I mean, you've walked alongside uh, the late Dr. Miles Monroe. You've been to different nations and spoken to presidents. You are uh, you are a significant person, not just because you say you are, but because you are. But yet, uh, we see you not trying to be a man. You are still. Uh, a woman and you present yourself as a woman. But we know that even, I'm sure when you started back in the day, women struggled to be in a men's world as they called it, uh, but you have successfully walked in it and you're still standing. What has been key to you standing in the midst of men, as they say, and staying humble despite the levels of um, influence that God has brought you to? Thank you for your gracious words. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know about being influential all around the world, but definitely uh, not just nominated, but um, listed several times as one of the top 10 most influential black Christian women in the nation. But you know what? Let me tell you a little bit about history. You may have heard me talk about my daughter. I had a child out of wedlock several years, 31 years ago. Mm. I was a church leader and I had a baby. And I thought that I would never be, at that time, I didn't even want to be, a, you know, anything. I didn't think God was going to use me as a preacher. I just wanted to, if God would have just used me to just clean the toilets, I would have been happy. That's all I wanted to do. Just, can I still serve you by cleaning the toilet? Surely I can't do any harm in cleaning the toilets. And, and it, it pleased God in his mercy to forgive me and to give me a future and give me a hope. <laughs> There's something about recognizing what God has done for you. That keeps you... Thank you for graciously saying I'm humble. I'm pleased. That keeps you humble. That keeps you obligated. It's called gratitude. When that woman with the alabaster oil poured the alabaster oil and people were bothering her, Jesus said, leave her alone. She said, he said in Luke 7, she's been forgiven much, so she loves much. See, I've mm. been forgiven much. I, I don't, I could have been, mercy has rewritten my life. There's not. The doors that open, I couldn't open them myself. God opened them for me. Last night you were out on the call, on our prayer call. What would you say if I told you that there was somebody who's a governor of a bank of a nation who was on there? Wow. What would you say if I told you there were CEOs of national banks that I don't want to mention the names of those banks who were on that call? Who am I? Who is Celia? I struggle even with my English. So when you realize, <laughs> don't say that is, because that will make me worse. <laughs> you know, when you realize that, you know, I'm trying to say that it's not about my achievements. So you realize that God in his mercy has called the foolish and I qualify hmm. as foolish to confound the world. I have nothing to boast of. So Paul says this, I am who I am by the grace of God. When you realize you're who you are by the grace of God, what do you have that wasn't given you? Why would I vote myself and say I'm better than somebody else? When I know what has brought me this far, mercy, grace, renewed me, gave me a future, pardoned me. I, and so Paul says, I have an obligation. Say, if I don't preach, I'll be most miserable. First of all, I have an obligation. Secondly, I have a stewardship. Thirdly, I've been forgiven much. So I like the words of the hymn writer that says, where the whole realm of nature mine, that would still be an offering far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my life, my soul, my all. What could I give him except to surrender to his will? Besides, there's nothing else out there for me. I already wrote my obituary, maybe 25, 30 years ago. I want on my tombstone to say, a charge to keep I have. That's my mantra, a God to glorify. A never dying soul to save and fit it for the sky. To serve the present age, my calling to fulfill. And made all my powers engage to do my master's will. Arm me with zealous care and on my thyself rely. Assured if I my trust betray, I shall forever die. Write your mantra. Write what, what, what is pushing you. <laughs> Sit back and ask yourself, what is my why in life? A leader's why in life is more important than their what. Because your why would determine how you pray. I don't pray like everybody else. 
When God first called me to go to the nations, I got a globe. He told me, get a world map. I began to speak to the nations. Be open, be open, be open, be open. <laughs> so there's doors you might ask open that I might not ask open. But a leader's why is important. And so I found my why. Then I placed myself in the why and I thought, not what I will, but what you will, God. Not what I will. I'm still struggling. I don't always make it. But I know one thing. I've locked the door behind me. There's nowhere else to go. I'm a debt. Paul says it. I'm a debtor to the cross. You want to see a person's success? Look at what motivates their mind mm. and their heart. And when I look at Paul, that's what I admire about him. He says, I'm a debtor to the cross. I owe the cross something. I owe a debt I cannot pay. The only thing I could pay for is the surrender of my life. All that I am and ever hope to be, I lay it all down. I think this is where God can use a person who is broken, a person who has no life outside of God. But also, there's an audacity in me. I pray every day, Lord, whatever you're doing in the season, don't do it without me. Don't do it without. I want to be part of the action. So lots of times I put out my hand and say, draw me after you. Let us run together. Holy Ghost, I have no life. But I've made it my choice. I have no life by this. And I, I made, finally, I, I said to the enemy, I said, devil, I know you're wicked. I know you hate me, but I'm nice. I'll give you a choice. You can either stay away and leave me alone or you can mess with my life. But the day that you touch my life and you cut my life short, I will be more influential in my death than I am in my life because I'm like my yeah. big brother, Jesus. You can touch yeah. me. I'm warning you. But I'm more dangerous when I'm dead than when I'm alive. Wow. You make up your mind. Where's your life going? Then you remember what I said at the beginning, Psalm 49 verse 20. Man who has been given an honor to be a leader and is careless about it, does not comprehend it, does not sit down and figure it out and say, where am I going? You may not have all the answers, but at least ask yourself certain questions. How, what is it going to take to get me there? If I don't know it, what mm. must I do to know it? You understand? If you don't ask those things and protect it and guard it and become a kinsman, relate to it, your influence will die. You'll be like the beast that perish. Ask yourself the question. God has placed your purpose, your destiny, your leadership in a place where nobody could steal it inside you. Stop admiring Amen. people. Amen. And definitely stop procrastinating. Somebody says uh, procrastination mm. is the... Is, he says somebody said the procrastination is the is the rude audacity that expects God to give you another opportunity to do tomorrow what he asked you to do today. And I'm guilty, man. It's the rude, how very dare you audacity that expects God to give you another chance to do tomorrow at your, your convenience what he asked you to do out of obedience today. Today. Wow. <laughs> that is powerful. That is powerful. Ladies and gents, if you have any questions, please type them on now. If you have something bubbling on the inside of you that you want to know um, from Reverend Celia that I have not asked. Uh, one thing that I want to ask, um, I want to ask you is, um, when you look at today when you look at the women that are rising today or the women uh, that are aspiring to be leaders uh, what what's your heart what what do you see um by the way leadership is not developed in a day it is developed mm. daily so i see development i see when i see today's lead today's people today's leaders i feel sorry for them because um, what they have to contend with today is more than what I had to contend with in my day. We had life was simpler in my day. Today, mm -hmm. there's so many options. Life is more complex. In fact, they say that they, we live in a futuristic um, season where they describe the world that we live in even before COVID. Because last year, I hosted a, 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 a conference called Future Fit Church. Little, little did I know that COVID was coming mm -hmm. last November. And we looked at the four or five elements that they describe the world as volatile, um, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. That's the world. Who wants to grow up mm. in a world that's volatile, uncertain, ambiguous? That's why people <laughs> refuse to get the diet because you don't know whether your plans will come to work. You see, but 
you don't you can change the pathway that you want to get to your destination you don't change the decision to get to your destination mm. can i repeat that mm. you change yes, the please. pathway to get so if you're going somewhere and they say the roadblock you don't go back home you configure another way you do to find a way where you are going to arrive where you want to go and, 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 and I think that God has given a new roadmap, a fresh roadmap to this generation. And when I see them, I see that they are standing. We as older people must, I, my life, I want to create a platform where people stand on my shoulder so they don't have to repeat my mistakes. They don't have to go through what I've gone through so that it can launch them somewhere. So I see a generation that has much to contend with, but where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. So you, the younger generation has more opportunity to achieve greater things than we do. I see uh, you have to make up your mind and, and, and shut down. You know, I tell people, shut down the shade room, shut down this. You mm -hmm. make a choice because you have too many options and focus. Put your attention, determine that God will have my heart because right now it's harder for God to have people's heart right now. There are just too many distractions and too many ideologies that are feeding you of the internet. Too many. I still see young people who think abortion is fine because it's a human right. Mm, mm. There are ideologies that have been presented to them. The things they teach them at school are not biblical values. Whereas when I went to school, there were biblical values taught me. So we, we there are all these contentions. And then that last thing but not the least, because we're talking about leadership, I want to also say this that what's going to help this new younger generation or emerging generation or, or uh, is, is this. And, and maybe another time we will look at generations and the impact that they made. Um, but every generation makes a certain impact. I'm of a boomer generation. We created consumerism. That was the effect of my generation, consumerism. Um, but anyway, I don't want to get into all that. But when it comes to leadership, your challenge is going to be not to try and mimic the leadership that was before you. Mm. So seasons matter. The sons of Issachar understanding what uh, the times and the seasons knew what Israel ought to do. Your actions have to correlate with your understanding of the times. So also mm. the Ephesians says God um, administrates the contents of time. He says God um, who in sundry times and in various ways has spoken to us by the prophets. Today he chose to speak to us by his son. That's what Hebrews says. But Hebrews, Ephesians chapter 1 or 2, uh, hang on a minute, I'm trying to illustrate something, but i like to give a scripture first uh, so that people understand. And this will release somebody into their leadership to become today. Because a lot of times when you look at leadership, you think, oh, this is how they did it. This is how my leadership will be should be. So uh, Ephesians chapter 1, I think he says, Verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times. So there's a dispensation. So this time that we're in hasn't surprised God. This time that we're going in, God, from all of eternity, God knows his works. He's, he's waiting That's in right. eternity. His name is Olam. He's not bound by time. And so the Bible says he dispenses the contents of time in the dispensation of the fullness of time. So literally, Lady Nomsa, this is what God does. 1960. He poured me out, Celia. He's dispensing me into time so that mm. I come with what this season needs. My whole skill set, my whole mindset, my whole attitude, my whole passion, my whole burden has to fit the season. So God released me. There's a reason I wasn't born in 1983. There's a reason I wasn't born in 1979. There's a reason I wasn't born in 1990. There's a reason why I'm not born in 2020 because what God releases into the earth must fit with that. So as I said that as a foundation, let me show you the difference. God will give us leaders after his own heart. We know that. But God also gives us leaders that much the time that we're in. So in many ways, I, I don't feel that much sorry for this, this, this um, new emerging leaders, this younger generation, this new younger than me, because you have something that I don't have. That's why I've gotten into a birthing position. My, I'm in a birthing position to birth others. So watch David. God told David, I'm not going to let you build my temple because your hands are bloody. A lot of times we think because he killed people. No, it's because that may have been part of it. 
but also because he's a warrior. Watch this. God is about to, Israel made all of its wealth from the spoils of war. They would go to war, they would conquer nations, they would kill them, and then they bring their spoil, then they would create empires. Israel made, up until then, Israel had made all of its wealth from that kind of methodology. But God was bringing the nation into a time of, in a season of peace. Hmm. In a season of peace, you don't need a warrior. Because warriors, by nature, look for fights. And God says, I'm bringing the nation into a season of rest. So the next leader that he raises right. is an economic leader. He's a businessman. The guy doesn't think sword. He, does, he makes peace with all his father's enemies. He begins to open trade links. He opens the nation up to trade, up to tourism. Kings and queens come from afar to visit. They don't come to fight. So you see, because mm -hmm. God was bringing the nation into a season of peace, he gave them a, a leader that reflected Peace. Mm. So David mm. didn't try to make De Solomon like himself. He said, fear God like I, I fear God. These are the things, some of essentials that leaders need to do. But the rest is up to the season and what God wants to do with your life. So for this emerging generation, my message is this. Copy me, copy older people, copy other people. But don't adopt all of our strategies because you are configured to suit the future, which I am not configured for. Mm, Let me mm. explain this by using another example. Maybe that will be clearer. We know that God, uh, uh, I don't want to say killed his servant Moses, but allowed Moses to die and not go <laughs> to the promised land, right? I kind of mm. like to say God retired him early. Why, <laughs> Pastor Nomsa, why did God retire Moses early? Isn't it a bit unfair that Moses would do all this work and then get to the edge? And, and you don't eat the milk and honey. <laughs> you see, to us, it is punishment. Let me tell you something. What would you say if I told you that he didn't have the skill set to lead the people in the promised land? Wow. Moses is an administrative leader. Moses' whole configuration is an ability to create something out of nothing. So remember when he took over, he brought the nation out. It wasn't a nation yet. He made it a nation. He provided the first, he was the first prime minister. First, uh, he provided a constitution. He put infrastructure in place. Yeah, he, he built the first roads, the first temple. The first, he told the people how to inhabit. He gave them laws for agriculture. He gave them laws for, for, for business and for commerce. He gave them laws for HR. He gave them laws for keeping animals. It's all in scripture. He gave them laws for health and diet. Mm -hmm. He gave them laws for war. He gave them laws for immigration. This is how you treat the sojourner. This is how you treat the alien who is an illegal immigrant. This is how you treat your servants. All of those things he gave them. So now the nation has been built. The rule of law is there. Mm -hmm. You don't need an, a nation builder anymore. <laughs> at the end of Moses' life, if you look at the beginning of the book of Joshua, it doesn't begin with building stuff. It doesn't begin with infrastructure. That's it right. begins with wars. Right. So the leader, now the nations that are coming against Israel, don't worry about leader, building. They are coming as confederacies, teams of armies coming to war. You need a warring leader. So God look at Moses and say, ah, well done, bro, well done. <laughs> now I'm going to retire you. They call it death. Come and be with me <laughs> and observe. Be, join me as part of the cloud of witnesses. And let me put the person who now has the skill sets that is needed that is warrior. Hmm. That's why Joshua didn't build anything. Joshua is he's not mighty in pen. He's mighty in sword. Moses is mighty in pen. Because hmm. that hmm. which they did, their leadership was connected to the season. Wow. Do you get one? So if you take the, the position of David and Solomon, and under Solomon's uh, administration, if you put in a warrior, and all Solomon wants to discuss is GDPs and bottom yeah. line profits. You know what I'm saying? And that's what he's doing. And market forces. And you put a warrior in there. They'll be sitting down. <laughs> they can't. Down. They won't fit. <laughs> you know? And, and when warriors can't find anybody to kill outside, they start killing inside. That's why at the end, you were laughing. But the end of David's life, he asked his son Solomon, bring me the staff list. Mm. And then he says, you see this one? Kill them. Take them out. Sons of this one, they're too wild. Don't let them sit there. They will cause trouble for your government. Hmm. God introduces leaders according to the time. Crisis, by the way, 
it's not about what goes on in the crisis. It's your response to the crisis. In the crisis. It's wow. always, it's, too, it's opportunity and danger. It's the response to the crisis. It's a question of perspective. How you view the crisis, your judgment and your response. This is a great time for you. Hmm. The, wow. Don't survive. People who survive don't make it. Gideon tried to survive by threshing wheat in a wine press. An angel drove out his sorry behind and said, listen, this is not time for you to self-preserve and all you're doing is praying Psalm 91 and God keep me safe, God keep me safe. Why don't you start praying? God give me opportunity to lead. He hold his sorry behind and say, you have opportunity. Now go lead Israel and, mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. defeat the wow. Midianites. So we have opportunity right now. For the emerging leaders, you've got what it takes. Go for it, bro. Go for it, sis. Go for it, go for it, go for it. Mm -hmm. And I will vote for you. <laughs> Amen to that. Amen. Uh, and now, um, just before we end, you uh, you have um, a clientele in different. Uh, well, I was going across the board, both in the world uh, and in the church. Uh, and one of the things that we have discovered this year, especially, is that um, church is not essential after all. Uh, we thought we were important, but we are not as important as. We think we are according to the nation, uh, well, especially this um, the nation we live in. Uh, so my question to you is, from what you have seen, um, like you mentioned that you were in a meeting in November and some of the things that you were discussing, COVID-19 kind of you know, um, happened and it, pre it had prepared you for COVID-19. Uh, some of us, we were not so much prepared. We still had our prophecies in the church. We still had our power nights declaring what the year will be and it wasn't. Uh, so now we're thinking, what does tomorrow hold for the church? Let, um, let me take that in bits. And let me correct yes. something. First of all, it's not the church. It's the local assembly. Mm. So there's a big difference. The church is actually the ecclesia. It's mm. legislators. It's warriors. They call for war. They legislate what happens. And don't worry about the nation. It's not about, who told you that church is not important? The nation needs the church more than ever before now. But the thing is that you took away our gathering in buildings. You didn't take mm. away the church. Come on. Let me tell you something. God describes the church as salt and as light. Come on. Light is very visible. Salt is insidious. It's hidden. When you put salt in your soup, you can't see it, but it's having effect. So you put Come me on. in my room, I'm still having effect. because I'm salt. on. At some time, I'm visible. The, so I'm more Co or convert and then are more overt. So whichever way for this, we were born for this thing. God oversaw this thing. So hmm. when we are there praying, this thing has made every church pray more than anything else. When we release that door, get it back. Do we know what I'm saying? We are taking care of the future. They need us more and we are more effective now. Amen. Amen. Oh, somebody city. bring an offering. <laughs> There's not one single city you go in where there are no food banks assisting people in housing that churches are not behind it. Hey, come on. Come on. You know what I'm saying? The, the media might not address it because they don't agree with us. They think we're too moral, we're too this. It's all right. Jesus said they'll hate us just because your opinion of me doesn't make me who I am. Hmm. Hmm. We are still salt. Salt is insidious. Wow. You're still light. Light is abrasive. It's in your face. So part of our in-your-face activity has been turned into covert ones, assault. But we are very effective. It's only mm. because of our presence here that God is sustaining the world. When we leave, there's nothing. Wow. wow. So church is more effective. It is the gathering physically that we cannot do. You understand? And 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 who that has never stopped us. Do you know who our builder is? Do you know who the head is? The head is connected to the body. He calls me and you the body of Christ, but our head is still the Christ. And mm. he's still mm -hmm. connected. And he's never won a battle. And he is the one who owns the future. And he's the ancient of days who got to our future before. He's the one who controls and sustains all things by his word. How can we lose? The church in history has never lost. Amen. Even when they cut mm. off people's head and threw them to lions, they were still multiplying. Now we've yes, multiplied right. in this season. Hi, yeah, 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 yeah. The church <laughs> is marching on. It is marching on. It is growing. It is multiplying. It's duplicating. So we say, grow, church, grow, push, advance. Amen. Advance. Be active. So if you're listening to me and you haven't done anything, be active. 
Find something to do that adds value. Meet people, love on people. You don't have to know you're a Christian. Right. God knows. But do something. The church is an active thing. It's an active agent. You must ask. Market forces determine what we must do. And so market mm. forces have determined that we're indoors, but there's still things that we can do. But the church, when, when he breathes out the word church and he says, my ecclesia, my gathering of of legislators, people who determine what happens in their space and, and in their contested space and in their environment. He says that, and the gates of hell will not prevail. There will be resistance, but we're still winning. And his mm. word is still yea and amen. And he watches over his word to perform it. And he's still the one, the driving force. When you finish the church, there is no need for Christ. Mm. Remember, mm. we are his bride. We are his That's army. Right. We are his body. <laughs> the things he said, and we are his eternal bride. So you can't, you, the, and, and, uh, the church, the word ecclesia describes our nature and function. So the moment that we say that we are cut off, we are useless, then there's no need for the church. But there's nothing in scripture that, su su that suggests that. Wow. That is true. That is true. I could go on talking to you forever, but I know you had a meeting earlier just before we started. Um, end with this for us. Uh, when, uh, as a leader, like, you know, this past decade, the last 10 years ended up in, in an unexpected way uh, with the COVID. Uh, but when you look at the next decade, the next um, tomorrow, the next 10 years uh, coming in, starting by next year, what, as a leader, what are you looking forward to? Uh, or is there anything that you're looking forward to or you think everything that can be has already been? No, ma'am. It gets better and it gets worse. Hmm. There's a reset moment. Remember, um, we are the only ones who are surprised. God isn't surprised mm. at all. Mm. And I, at the beginning of COVID, I had this uh, vision of, of Noah. I get this revelation of Noah. And, 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 and Noah, there is, of course, God tells him to, to, to go into the ark. So that's a kind of a remnant. That's the word, remnant. There's a remnant. There's a remnant. There's a remnant that haven't bowed down their knees to bow. They haven't given up. A remnant is always a small amount of people that God's going to use for a purpose. I believe we've entered into a remnant season, you know, where there's a remnant that's being raised up. So Noah is a remnant. But the remnant, while he's safe in his ark, he's still watching. So there's a, a time that the rains have come, the floods have come. And while they're stopping, he's still watching for to see when it will stop. So Noah keeps watching. We know that he keeps sending the birds out. For this time, the church has to keep looking out. For the next decade, we have to keep looking out because even the world has recognized we are in a reset mode. But who is going to reset, God or man? When the church sleeps on the job, man will reset. Man is full mm -hmm. of evil, wickedness, and worldly and ethical, immoral values. Are we going to? No. The kingdom, God, I told you already in Deuteronomy 4, he called the church a nation within a nation. He said, I'll give you laws and statutes, how to govern, how to live, even for our penal system. Mm -hmm. Even if you kill a, a horse, how you, how, what kind of punishment you should get. So God covers every single thing. So we have to be the ones that enforce the resource, reset, working with the world, if you like. And so, by the way, even Joseph gave Pharaoh a 14-year economic plan. Hmm. So he gave him an agricultural plan, a commercial plan, a, a retail plan. All of it is for another conversation. So you see, we, 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 when we're talking about the church, I'm talking about the church and how it interfaces with society. And so we reset. So Noah is watching until, and he keeps sending birds to watch. So let's keep watching. Let's keep watching. Watch and pray. The Bible says be very circumspect. Be very selective where you put your foot. Don't sleep. He says awake you who sleeper and Christ will give you revelation. So right now we're called to awake. We're called to watch. We're called to be sensitive about our environment what to see. And finally, Noah doesn't open the door until the, the bird come, doesn't come back. So he knows it's dry. The ground is still wet. Don't open the door mm. too much. I'm not talking about church service. I'm saying let's not be presumptuous. We're still watching. And when Noah gets out of the ground, out, out of the ark, the first thing he does is he offers a sacrifice. Mm. After he connects back to God in a greater way concerning the land. Now God says to him, very important, be fruitful and multiply. Where did we hear that before? Genesis chapter one, beginning. reset. Mm. He wow. said, go and set things back the way that they did. Namsa, God is calling you to reset. Find mm. your lane, find your area. 
what can you reset? What can you do? God's calling Celia, God's calling your husband, God's calling this person, God's calling that person to reset. The reset is still in our hands. If we let the world ball down, God will either raise another remnant or he will let the world take it until he, there's another cycle of another uh, uh, generation that will come up and cause men to call upon the name of the Lord again. The next 10 years, I'm saying, let's watch it. Let's be watchful. Let's not sleep on the job. Let's be quick to move. Let's follow mm. the Holy Spirit. He still did. This is his earth. He had a plan for it. He hasn't stopped. He's not faced by COVID. Give, COVID gives an opportunity for David's to come forth, Daniel's to come forth, Esther's to arise, and then kings come to our brightness. So God uses a COVID to expose his church and to make it more powerful and make it more influential. Amen. This is our time. The next 10 years, I'm watching and I'm ready to reset. <laughs> Wow, wow. Amen, amen to that. God bless you. For um, a young leader, an older leader that is uh, listening uh, and that has been thinking like, I don't know what's, what to do with my organization. I don't know what's happening. I'm a bit confused. How can they get in touch with you, uh, especially for your mentoring programs and some of the leadership okay. uh, programs that you do? So our, our email address, just drop me an email. It's info at rehobothfoundation.com. Info, I-N-F-O at Rehoboth, which is R-E-H-O-B-O-T-H foundation, F-O-U-N-D-A-T-I-O-N.com. Uh, you can also drop me an email on C-A-A-C as personal. Don't tell anybody. That's just me <laughs> because of Lady Nomsa. C-A-A-C 60 at yahoo.co.uk. C-A-A-C-60 at yahoo.co.uk. Of course, please visit me on Facebook at Rev Celia PJ. At Rev Celia PJ. My Instagram is at Rev Celia. At Rev I was going to say, are you on Instagram for the younger generation? I am on Insta, my dear. I am on IG. Yeah. So please visit. Please leave your comments. Um, and um, yes, yeah, so I'm on Facebook as well. And I'm on Insta. I'm on LinkedIn as well. So please, whatever you do, connect. You can also call us on 07958. Is this no? Let me 07985. I beg your pardon. I haven't had lunch or dinner or breakfast. <laughs> 07985 290192. 07985 290192. And of course, if all else fails, you can find us on Google. And we've got lots of videos on uh, YouTube as well. God bless you. It's been such a privilege and an honor serving. I hope I can come back. Definitely, <laughs> definitely. Uh, thank you so much for uh, honoring us oh, and I'm on uh, by you. accepting our I, invite. We really honor you. what you have poured out today. Uh, we will definitely um, show all the details as well uh, in the link of this uh, broadcast. Uh, wow, uh, we will have you in the new year. We will definitely have you in the new year. <laughs> I'm on TBN. I think I have a program coming up on December the 7th, but watch out for TBN this Christmas. I've done quite a few programs for them. So you'll be you'll be seeing me on TBN. Just watch out. And do leave your comments on TBN. Just say if you're blessed, just say, just say, wow, awesome, glorious, I'm blessed. Just leave your comments on TBN UK. God bless you. TBN UK. There you go. You've got it, guys. Thank you so much, Reverend Celia. We will be uh, in touch for our next invite. God bless no you. Problem. Thank you so much. Go get them. Let your light shine. Thanks. Very Amen. Much. <laughs> Wow, wow, what a blessing, what a time of revelation, divine inspiration, and great wisdom uh, from the great and legend uh, Reverend Celia. I have been blessed. I hope you've been blessed and taken some notes. If you're a woman or a man that is uh, an emerging leader uh, or you're a leader already uh, in your own right, take notes of what we have spoken about today. You know, uh, God is doing a new thing. God will always be doing a new thing, but God has called you for such a time as this, and you need some of the wisdom that she was, uh, not some, all the wisdom that she was sharing with us today for you to be a great leader and influential leader with power. Power with power. That is one thing that you need to take out of um, this broadcast today. As a leader, 
you need power and you can have it, especially for today. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, follow us on any platform that you see us on and God bless you for staying with us for such a long time. Uh, we've gone past our time, but we thank you for that. Uh, just before we leave, I want to take this privilege and honor to invite you uh, tomorrow for our church inauguration service taking place tomorrow. Uh, to be live on Facebook and um, yeah, uh, YouTube as well. Uh, Spirit Life Church inauguration service. You heard uh, Reverend Celia, God is doing something and is always moving. His spirit is always moving. So join us for church as uh, Spirit Life Church inauguration tomorrow at uh, uh, on all social media um, from 4 to 6 o'clock, 4 p.m. to 6 o'clock. It's going to be a great time. Thank you so much for uh, being with us today. God's girls, wives with wisdom. Stay blessed as you continue to be a blessing. Much love. Bye.